today's session so that if you wanted to go back and re listen to something, you had access to do that. If you needed to share this with any other colleagues in your organizations, you could do that as well. We will take questions at the conclusion of the contract and program requirements section. And again, at the end, and Vanessa is uh, available ongoing to support you. I will ask Vanessa to give a huge wave. She is the community partnership officer who will be supporting you ongoing. I know, I think all of you have had the opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one with Vanessa uh, and have been receiving uh, communication from her. We are so thrilled to have her as part of the Minnesota housing team and in support of the work that you'll be doing around community engagement. So I know you'll enjoy working with her and just really encourage you to reach out whenever you have any questions. She is there to support you and this work. Um, and it's really thrilled to be able to do that. So, and we're thankful to have her as part of our team. A last reminder as we move into today's session is just please mute yourself unless you are speaking. Uh, that will help just with the background noise and make sure that we've got good clarity and sound today. I know sometimes uh, virtual can be amazing, but occasionally there are technology challenges. So thanks for doing your part uh, and muting yourselves unless you're in a speaking role. Next slide, Colleen, or asking a question, which are welcome to. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa and she's going to cover today's agenda with all of you. So again, on behalf of the Minnesota housing team, um, we're thrilled to have you. We're thrilled to be together, at least virtually. We know this will be an important relationship uh, over the next several years together. Um, so we just really look forward to engaging with you today and into the future and know that this is the start of engagement. There'll be lots of time to ask questions um, and learn more about the home health program and just stay connected, particularly as we move into an official start to planning around uh, the launch of the home health program. So look forward to engaging with all of you today. Vanessa. Yes, thanks, Devin. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad to see you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to take just a minute to walk through our agenda to see where we're going this afternoon. First, we're going to do some introductions in just a minute, which will be great to hear from you all and see who we have in the room. We're also going to cover quite a few of program requirements. So Chrissy and I will be covering those from Minnesota Housing. There is a lot to work through, um, but we'll have time for questions for sure. And then we hope to also cover, uh, well, we will cover marketing and communications as well. So an introduction of what's to come. We'll be talking a lot about marketing and communications at our January 31st meeting. So today will just be an introduction from um, my colleague Amanda Welliver. We'll also be introduced to our monitor monitoring team here at Minnesota Housing. So either Ruth or Anjanette will introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do here and what to expect from them. And we'll have some more time at the end for questions. I anticipate there will be lots of questions that come up later as well. You can always reach me by phone or email, so don't feel like you need to ask all the questions today. Happy to talk to you offline as well if you have any detailed things you want to work through. So that's where we're going today. And so now, Colleen, if you could stop screen sharing, we'll do some introductions. And I will do my best to call on folks. I think that works a little bit easier. Um, hopefully I can see everyone. And then if I mispronounce your name, please correct me. I'll do better next time. And I'm thinking we can do our name, our organization, where you're located, and then favorite winter activity. So I'll start. I'm Vanessa Haight. I'm with Minnesota Housing. I'm in Minneapolis. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And my favorite winter activity is really sitting under a warm blanket and reading a book. I'm not a huge fan of the cold weather. I do force myself to get outside, but I like to, to stay inside and stay warm. Let's see, Mahmoud, if you could go next. Hello, and my name is Mahmoud. I am in St. Paul, and I am the executive director of Youth and Family Circle. My favorite activity in the winter is to look outside and not go outside. <laughs> I'm there with you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Amanda, do you want to go next? Sure, my name is Amanda Welliver. I'm with the communications um, for Minnesota Housing and the federally funded COVID relief programs. I use she, her pronouns. I live in St. Paul and 
Um, prior years, I might have said cross country skiing, but this winter I am all about the warm blanket in a book also. So nice. Team stay inside. All right, let's see. Sharon. Sharon from Stair Step. Do you want to go next? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharon Thompson. I work with with and for the Sears Step Foundation here in Minneapolis. Mm, winter, I like to uh, be in Florida. <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot, but <laughs> that's my goal. Get to Florida as often as possible. Um, and I think that's she, her uh, pronoun. Fantastic. Well, we're in this together, I think. <laughs> All right, let's see. Colleen. Hello, my name is Colleen Meyer, and I'm the executive assistant for the single family division at Minnesota Housing, um, and also help out with a number of things on the Home Help MN program. Um, and I use she, her pronouns, and uh, I'm going to join the chorus and say I'm not a, a, a cold outdoors person. Uh, so probably uh, sitting by my mom's fireplace drinking cocoa, I'm going to say is the best winter activity for me. <laughs> Very nice. All right, Dave. That must be me. Uh, Dave Anderson, I'm the Executive Director of All Parks Alliance for Change, or APAC. Uh, the parks are referred to in the name are manufactured home parks. Uh, I use he, him, and um, oh, well, I do love uh, getting out and sledding or tubing. Um, uh, although now I have a 12-year-old who's not necessarily as interested uh, in, in those activities, but uh, Thank oh, you. and I'm, uh, uh, our office is based in St. Paul, but I live in Minneapolis, so I, I, I bridge the cities. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. All right. Let's see. I think it's Matur, M-A-T-U-O-R. Hi, everyone. I'm Matur Alier. I'm the executive director of South Sudanese Foundation, and I don't like winter. <laughs> <laughs> Even staying inside, I don't like it, but I have to stay warm. <laughs> and I'm in Moorhead, Minnesota. Great, thanks for being here. All right, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Olson from Somali Community Resettlement. Um, I'm located in sunny southern Minnesota, and I like to ice skate. Nice. Fantastic. All right, let's go with Ruth. Hi, I'm Ruth Dubose. Um, I'm with Minnesota Housing. I'm the um, compliance specialist, so I'll be talking a little bit later about uh, what that means uh, as it relates to working um, with all of you um, later on. Um, and uh, let's see, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I have a three-year-old, and so our very survival is dependent on being able to go outside in all weather, um, or we'll just go crazy, um, stir crazy being inside. So we like to sled and um, go for short little hikes if we can. So I think that covers everything. Thanks. Very nice. Thank you. Well, let's go to Connie, or C-A-N-I. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Kenny Allen with uh, South Sudanese Foundation as well. We work in uh, uh, Mohead area uh, and I, I, I have nothing that I like in winter time uh, because I came from uh, Somalia where 90 degrees all the time. So thanks everyone. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, let's see. Let's go with Hyan. I think there's a few of you from the organization, so if you want to take turns. Introducing yourselves. Hi, uh, my name is Farhan Mahmoud. I'm uh, the executive director of Hayan. We're located in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, my favorite winter activity is just staying warm, staying inside, 
averting the cold and, you know, trying to forget about winter and look forward to the summer. Yes, right there with you. All right, Chrissy. Hello, Chrissy Mills, she, her. I work at Minnesota Housing on the Home Help team. Um, we are based in St. Paul, our offices, but working at home, I work from my home office in Maplewood. Um, I am also team inside. So as much as I want to get out every winter, as soon as it dips below 30, doesn't happen. <laughs> I hear ya. All right, Asad. Hi, uh, my name is Assad Adewade. I am the executive director of New American Development Center uh, that works with the East African immigrant community, especially Somalis and, and, and Roma community. Uh, my favorite activity in the winter, you know, where I came from, Somalia, and that part of the world, usually we don't even have a winter or snow. So I don't really have activity. I don't go outside, but I go inside. I, I like to walk into the malls. I like to read. I like to stay indoors. I don't want to go outside. Winter is really horrible on me. Thank you. Thanks, Asad. Uh, Jabir. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Jabir Khalif. I also work for uh, NADC, and our office is located in Minneapolis. And I also currently reside here, too. And uh, uh, winter is not my favorite season, but I just stay in. Me too. All right, Jeanette. Hi, my name is Jeanette Lieberman. I work with the Law Assistance Center um, of Minnesota. We're located in Minneapolis, but we serve um, statewide, particularly in Albert Lee and War Road and Worthington um, and St. Cloud. My favorite winter activity. Um, is of course doing whatever it needs to be done with the kids. Just the same as I know someone else mentioned, getting them outside. We still go to the park, still go on the swings, go down the slides. We just really kind of gear up and get outside. But then if it's below zero, we'll stay inside and do a lot of board games. So that ends up being a lot of fun. Yeah, kids will get you outside even if you don't like the winter, right? <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, and Jeanette. Hi, my name is Ian Jeanette. I'm a compliance analyst on the monitoring team of Minnesota Housing. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, the office is in St. Paul, but I'm in Richmond, Wisconsin. And then we are outside all the time. Um, we have a few acres and animals and need to chop wood to stay warm here. So we're always outside doing something. So nice to meet you all. Nice. Good to hear it. All right, Mike, Mike Olson. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm with uh, Somali Community Resettlement Services. We're uh, in Minneapolis, uh, also Faribault. Um, my favorite thing to do is probably go skiing, but with how cold it's been, it's been a lot of just watching movies. <laughs> so, thanks. Movies are a good way to get through the winter, that's for sure. Let's see, um, Tiffany. Hi, I'm Tiffany Canaday, and I'm with Youth and Family Circle. I'm helping them with grants, and I'm the oddball. I'm in Hickory, North Carolina, so I like to play in the snow when we get it, and I'm hoping we get some to kill some of our bugs <laughs> for the summertime, and, and I use the she, her um, pronouns. Thanks. Thank you. Soak up the warmth for us. All right, I see, um, it's, I think it's Molid, M-O-W-L-I-I-D. Yep, that's right. Hi, my name is Molid Korea. I also work with NADC, New American Development Center. Uh, we're located in Minneapolis, and we're also doing uh, MN Run Help. And uh, yeah, my favorite thing in the winter, basically, on the weekend, I like to run, run in the snow. Very nice. Impressive, even. <laughs> All right, um, Judy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Really looking forward to our partnership with all of you. I am Judy Mortensen, the operations manager in the single family division. 
My pronouns are she, hers. I live up in Wyoming, Minnesota, not in the state of Wyoming. Um, and my favorite winter activity is probably snowmobiling. Very nice, adventurous. All right, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Deegan. I'm Director of Federal Affairs at Minnesota Housing. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a Nordic skier, and like Malid, I run all winter. Uh, doesn't matter really the temperature, but I couldn't do any of that without my sauna. So I'm thankful for my sauna all winter. Nice. Anika. Hi there, this is Anika. Sorry for the background. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the Anika Foundation. We're based in the Twin Cities, but our footprint is statewide, in particular in Mankato, Duluth, and Rochester. What was the second part of the question? What do you like to do in the winter? Go to the beach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hear you. Me too. All right, Anthony. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony. Um, I work with the Law Center of Minnesota. Um, Jeanette kind of briefly just um, explained our organization. We're based here in Minneapolis. Um, at the Law Center, I am the Housing Stability Coordinator. And so we also work with Rent Out Minnesota and some other projects here as, um, as well. Some of my favorite winter activities is just kind of creating a cozy ambiance environment. I'm staying in, whether it's next to a fire, some cozy uh, blankets and things like that. I also like to go on hikes and whatnot as well. So if it's about outside. Nice, good balance. All right, I think I called on everyone, but I want to pause for a moment. Did I miss anyone? Do you want to go ahead and speak up? All right, I think that's everyone. What a great group. Thank you for taking a moment to introduce yourselves. I think it's an important step to just see who else is in the room. I think there's probably some familiar faces for you all. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Devin, who's going to give a program overview. All right, thanks, Vanessa. I'll ask Colleen to pull the PowerPoint back up and I know who I'm not running with uh, at this point in time in the winter. I know who I want to go to Florida with and who I might like to ice skate with. So uh, I love this. So thanks for sharing a, a little bit about how you get. <laughs> I loved hearing all of your your uh, your winter time, uh, what what you do to get through it or enjoy it, depending on you know how you feel about it. So our mission at the agency uh, is that housing is the foundation for success. So we collaborate with individuals, communities, and partners to create, preserve, and finance housing that is affordable. Certainly in the context of the Home Help MN program, we wanna do everything we can do to help preserve home ownership opportunities for those who may have fallen behind due to a COVID-19 impact. And that's really what we're um, centering around uh, together with our Home Help work here at Minnesota Housing and with all of you. Next slide, Colleen. When we started uh, to implement the Home Health Program, so this is a national program that's funded through the American Rescue Plan through the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Um, and as we um, received our allocation of funding statewide, which is about $128 million in funding for the state of Minnesota, uh, and knew that we had to develop a plan that the U.S. Department of Treasury will approve, so we are unique. Uh, because we have to, every state that is implementing home help has to have a plan that gets approved by the Department of Treasury. We are in the active stages. I think uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we are close to having our plan approved by Treasury. Um, we've had several interactions with them. We know they've done a thorough review of our plan. Um, and as we've been developing our plan to implement this important program here in Minnesota, we developed six key guiding principles that really need to center our work and how we will do our work um, with home health. So I invite you to help keep us uh, intellectually honest and to make sure we are uh, managing the program in a way that helps put these guiding principles at the forefront. The first is that we want to have a human-centered um, approach to our work. We want to make sure we build empathy and understanding to serve homeowners who may otherwise be left behind, but for this resource. The second is that we want to be intentional with respect to race equity strategies in our design and delivery 
to actively dismantle structures that perpetuate disparities to achieve more equitable outcomes. We know this is absolutely critical in a home ownership context where there's a history of redlining, there's a history of disproportionate impact. We know many BIPOC communities um, have had very significant impacts as it, as it relates to COVID-19. In this program, we wanna do everything we can to help make sure we are reaching those communities with these resources and appreciate your support in that regard. We also want the program to be focused and we wanna focus on mitigating homeowner displacement due to financial hardship associated with the coronavirus pandemic. There are a number of different ways the program can be used. Um, we are being very intentional about how these funds can be used here in Minnesota um, to really help prevent and prohibit uh, displacement from home ownership opportunities and trying to leverage other resources that might be available for other things homeowners might need help with, such as utility payments, but not to be paid directly through from the Home Help MN program. And we'll have opportunities to engage in dialogue more about some of those things. We also want the program to be straightforward. We know homeowners that will need this assistance may very well be experiencing uh, stress and complexity and uncertainty, um, and that can just be a really hard time. And so we wanna do our part to make sure the process is work, works in a very straightforward and transparent manner. We want the program to be accountable, um, timely, flexible, and meet homeowner needs within the parameters of the treasury guidelines that we can manage the program to but we ultimately want to ensure program accountability and appreciate your help and reach in making sure that we're delivering this program to the communities that most need it here in the state of Minnesota. And then most foundationally and important is that we want to uh, engage critical partners led by organizations by and for and working with communities most impacted by housing disparities and homeownership disparities to make sure we realize equitable outcomes with this resource. So we want to make sure meaningful engagement is a key part of this program from the very beginning. And we're excited to start this engagement with all of you because, and it's the right time to start engaging as we start to move into selecting our contractor and vendor who will be managing this program for us so that we can um, develop and work together in partnership to help make sure that community engagement and those outreach strategies really come first um, to best serve communities most in need. Next slide, Colleen. So what exactly is the Homeowner Assistance Fund Program? You will hear it called both the Homeowner Assistance Fund Program, HALF, as well as Home Help Minnesota. We have branded the National Homeowner Assistance Fund Program, Home Help MN, um, as the Minnesota specific program, but it's also known as the Homeowner Assistance uh, Fund Program nationally. Its purpose is to mitigate housing related financial hardships associated with the COVID-19 pandemic to help resolve homeowner mortgage and housing related delinquency or default and to prevent foreclosure and displacement when possible. That's really what the program is designed to do. Next slide, Colleen. In Minnesota, we anticipate making our direct financial assistance that will be available under the program available for three broad types of activities. The first is to help support homeowners with mortgage reinstatement assistance. Reinstatements could be used in cases where a homeowner has had some back payments, so they've missed some amount of mortgage payments as a result of that COVID-19 hardship and need help getting caught up with those payments. Um, missing um, one or more mortgage payments can be really, really difficult, trying to come up with those arrearages and the back payments. In this program, we anticipate that the bulk of the assistance will be made in the form of mortgage reinstatement, which will help those homeowners who ultimately are eligible for the program be able to cure the arrearages and the back payments um, that they weren't able to pay as a result of that COVID-19 impact to get them caught up on their mortgage payments. In other situations, the next um, bullet is for loan modification assistance. We anticipate this might be less common, but that there may be homeowners that still need um, help supporting their ongoing monthly mortgage payments, but they need the mortgage payments to be made more affordable. Uh, the home help assistance, the maximum amount of assistance will be $35,000. We'll cover that in a future slide. Um, but that amount could be used in some circumstances to do what's called a principal write-down reduction, 
where essentially the overall mortgage balance gets written down by the maximum or some amount of that assistance that's allowable to help make the ongoing monthly mortgage payment affordable. That may work in some situations and other situations it may not, depending on what's happened from an income perspective to individual homeowners. But if possible, Minnesota would like to try to support homeowners that have had some loss of income but can still sustain monthly payments on their mortgage um, going forward with a loan modification. There are a lot of things we're still working out kind of in this space because we need loan servicers to be able to participate and ultimately accept this form of assistance. Um, so this is one area that we're still developing inside the program and internal to the program, but we are trying to make sure the program uh, can help limited numbers of borrowers that might benefit um, from some write down of their mortgage balance to get that mortgage payment affordable long term. But this would be a more limited number of borrowers, most likely. We're anticipating most borrowers would benefit from the reinstatement assistance to cure those arrearages. The third eligible area would be for something called property charge defaults or property charge default assistance. This would be in cases where homeowners may not have a mortgage. Um, or they might need a combination of different types of assistance. They might need a reinstatement. Plus, they owe back taxes if those taxes aren't escrowed by the loan servicer, right? If they escrow, if they pay their own taxes and aren't escrowing the taxes. But they may owe back taxes. They may owe um, insurance or a homeowner's association fees. Um, or in cases where they own the manufactured home, they may owe, owe lot rent as well. And so those types of um, fees and delinquencies could also be supported by the home help program. Next slide, Colleen. In terms of eligibility and prioritization, um, the household income limit that we've established for the program is 100% of area median income or 100% of the median income for the United States, whichever is greater. As we engage further with you in the coming weeks, um, we can provide more information on kind of what these AMI levels are um, by county and in Minnesota so that you have a better sense of what this translates into. But essentially, we're serving people um, at a fairly generous income level under the program. Treasury is also asking that we target and prioritize serving individuals that are socially disadvantaged individuals. Um, that's a term that's defined in the Treasury guidance as socially disadvantaged individuals. Those include in the state of Minnesota, they would include um, homeowners that um, have limited English proficiency, homeowners that live on an Indian reservation, homeowners that live in a majority minority census tract, as well as other homeowners um, who are members of a group that have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudice or cultural bias within American society. So this is really where that outreach to homeowners um, becomes really so critical in helping make sure that homeowners that may face barriers have good access, knowledge, and understanding about how to reach and use this program if they need it. As I mentioned, uh, the maximum household assistance is $35,000 that is in the form of a grant that will be paid um, to a third party payee. So if somebody owes back taxes or if somebody owes arrearages on their mortgage payment, it would go directly to the county in the case of the taxes or the loan servicer in the case of the mortgage. The funds will not be paid directly to homeowners themselves, but to the third party payee to whom the funds are owed under this program. Owner occupied homes um, that are the primary residence in one to four dwelling units are permitted. So that's gonna be the bulk of ownership situations, um, but it certainly would exclude cases where if someone were behind on a mortgage for a vacation home or a cabin, or those things would not be allowed. But otherwise, we're really looking to support owner occupied homes, primary residences. And the homeowner has to demonstrate that they've had a financial hardship after January 21st of 2020. That can be in one of two different forms as allowable by Treasury. The first would be the homeowners experienced a material reduction in income or they've experienced a material increase in living expenses. I think the second bullet is really important because that's a space where you know, we know some families have welcomed other family members who've lost housing or lost jobs, 
and they've brought them into their home or they've expanded caregiving um, functions within their home and may have had additional increases in their living expenses or changes in insurance status or other things. And that would uh, enable someone to be eligible for this program as well. So just want to be clear that the guidance both incorporates reduction in income, but also material increases in living expenses that many of our community members may have um, had as well. Next slide, Colleen. In terms of our implementation partners and stakeholders, we know that homeowners are the key uh, group that we are uh, looking to support and help uh, with this program, homeowners that are facing delinquency, default, or foreclosure. Again, we know how critical our Community Connector grantees will be in helping us to reach homeowners that may need to access this resource and making sure we really get the word out and are intentional about that in the communities we're serving. We also know that we'll need marketing, outreach, and strategic communication support. And so we have hired a marketing vendor. That will be a really important relationship with our community connectors as well. Our vendor will be creating a toolbox and a kit that will allow you to use a lot of customized materials to get information out to the communities that you serve and reach. Um, Amanda will give a quick intro today, but then at our meeting on the 31st, We'll be intentional with our agenda and time to make sure that there's more time uh, to connect with both with our marketing vendor as well as around that toolkit and what some of the resources will be um, so that you'll be able to share more information out to your communities with tools from, from that toolkit. We know that housing counselors will be critical in helping to support homeowners. Um, housing counselors are, uh, are offered statewide um, HUD certified housing counselors are free and available, and that's an immediate resource as you're starting to work with communities, even well before the program actually opens, that you can start referring homeowners to if they need a place to go, because housing counselors um, can provide great counseling assistance, including budgeting support for families, as well as exploring other loss mitigation workout options that may be available from loan servicers. So they're going to be a critical resource. And then legal service providers like legal aid, um, other entities like that will also be important in cases where there may be um, issues or challenges that have a legal context that need resolution or potentially need to be filed with other consumer protection agencies because we want to make sure people's legal rights are being upheld. Um, we will be contracting for services to support the operations of this program. So we will be, we're in the middle of finalizing that contract and negotiating that contract now, but we will be opening a call center that will serve the state of Minnesota and provide assistance. And call center assistance will be provided in uh, Hmong, Spanish, Somali with access to other languages. And then that center will also process applications all the way through to payment processing. And they're going to really be a critical partner in delivering this program statewide. And then last but not least, we know that loan servicers, counties for tax payment payments, homeowners association, contract for deed holders, manufactured park lot owners, um, variety of other partners will be really critical in helping to um, finalize, approve and receive payments on behalf of homeowners that qualify and are eligible for the program. I think that's it for me in terms of the broad overview. And I know we'll have time kind of throughout our relationship. If you have questions stemming from today, um, want more information on certain things, please reach out to Vanessa and we can make sure that we're continuing to customize and deliver you good quality information about the program at our January meeting and then at meetings following that as well. But I will turn it back over to Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. It's great to hear that overview of the program and look forward to sharing more details as they become available. Next slide, please. Looks like one more. Maybe a couple more to the timeline. There we go. Wanted to give a brief overview of where we're going in the next few weeks up to a couple months from now. So last week I sent the contract packages to you all, so you have those in your inboxes. This week we will be sending the contracts to sign through DocuSign. So look back at that email I sent last week. There are some attachments that you'll need to send to me over email, but then the signing of the contract will actually happen through DocuSign. And then we'll meet up again on January 31st 
As Devin mentioned, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on marketing and communications. We'll also provide some follow up to this meeting as well as updated information on the program. And then February 15th is the date we set to um, have the contract signage completed by. So we'll want to get all the contracts signed by then as well as the documentation that you need to send to me as well. And then that will give us February and March to really get planning, getting gear for the program launch. So I know some of you have folks that you need to hire to do the outreach and setting up program files, all that sort of work. We'll have a couple months to get ready for, which will be great. We won't have to rush right into the outreach. All right, next slide, please. So Chrissy and I are going to cover the contract and program requirements. There's quite a few here. Uh, we have done our best to streamline these. And just remember, I'm here to support you as we work through all of this. So if there's questions or confusion, you can always reach out to me for clarification. Next slide, please. So as it's been mentioned, both state and federal requirements apply to this funding. It may seem a bit overwhelming. There's a lot to work through and a lot in that contract, um, but we're going to spend some time really looking at all of these requirements today. Something that's important to note is that monitoring of complying with all these requirements may occur by the state team, so the Minnesota housing team, or and or it may occur by the federal team. And so we'll want to do our best to set up processes and procedures early. Um, the requirements are quite significant, so you'll want to go back to your team and talk through these requirements and make sure you have the processes and the procedures set up on your end to comply. Um, and then remember, I'm here to help. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the work plan and budget first. We have spent quite a bit of time looking at these the last month, and I think they're all in really great shape and finalized. But I want you to remember that they're formal exhibits on the contract, so they'll be attached to your contract. Be sure to look through these when they come through in DocuSign to make sure they're, they're what you want. The budget is set up how you want it to be, and the work plan describes the work that you're going to tackle. We will be looking to make sure that you follow those work plans and those budgets. And as always, things change. And so if you expect or anticipate something that will change, just reach out to me and we'll work through making adjustments. But the most important thing to do is to reach out early so we can make sure that everything is still eligible and in compliance. I think next slide, please. Yes. OK, sub grantees wanted to spend just a minute talking about this. So sub grantees we're defining as individuals or organizations that are doing un ongoing work under this contract for you. And so there's two organizations that we've identified as having sub grantees, Lao Assistance Center and Stair Step. So your two organizations, I will be setting up individual meetings in the next week or so to just talk through what this means. But a quick overview is that all of the contract and program requirements we're going to talk about also apply to the sub grantees and it will become your responsibility as a grantee to make sure that your sub grantees comply. So things that you'll need to be sure to do is monitor compliance. So make sure your sub grantees understand the requirements and are following through. Be sure to report on their sub grantees progress and use of funds. And then you're going to want to retain documentation from your sub grantees in case of monitoring or audits. So again, I'll be meeting with the two of you in the next week or so to talk through this. Next slide, please. Contracting and bidding. So when you pay for a product or service with these funds, contracting and bidding requirements may come into play. And so this includes everything from, you know, if you're paying someone to do a print job, if you're paying for interpretive services, or if you're paying for a part of your fringe benefits like insurance through these funds, that would also count as a vendor. So the email I sent last week included a form to fill out to list all of your vendors that you intend to pay for. So as long as you fill that out from the get go, we will have that on file. 
Um, there are a couple of requirements that you need to do for each of these vendors. You need to do a suspended and debarred check for each one, including the ones that you're going to submit to me on that form. Next slide, please. The suspended and debarred check includes checking three different sites. So you're going to want to check the state of Minnesota report, the Minnesota housing report, and then the federal debarment list on SAM.gov. And the last site, the SAM.gov, is a bit of a pain to navigate through. You have to create a login. It's not real user friendly. So I'm going to host two tutorials, one of them being this Friday and again next week, where you can just join me on Teams. I'll walk through it. We can do some debarred checks together so that you don't have to spend time learning how to navigate that site. It's it's really not worth it. Um, so I figured out how to navigate it. I will quickly show you and we can do it together. So please join me at one of those just to save yourself some time. And then as we move forward, if you consider adding or changing a vendor, and that again applies to something like if you change your insurance provider and you are paying for your insurance with part of these funds, you'll need to contact me before you hire that group so that we can work through what sort of contracting and bidding requirements it triggers. All right, next slide please. I'm going to hand it over to Chrissy Mills for the next few requirements. OK, there I am. Hello again. As Vanessa said, um, state and federal requirements apply to both grantees and subgrantees, so that applies to our data practices. The grantees and the subgrantees um, need to provide a privacy notice to individuals before collecting private information. And that's really broadly defined, and um, it includes information you would collect on sign-on sheets and in photos. Minnesota Housing will provide a Privacy Act notice for you to use if you choose to collect private data, but just note that you're not required to collect any private data for this program. Next slide, please. The Minnesota Government Data Practices Act applies to all data created, collected, received, stored, used, maintained, or disseminated by the grantee under this grant contract agreement. You may, you may receive a data request from an outside party, and if you do, um, please let Ven Minnesota Housing or Vanessa know immediately, and we will provide instruction on how to proceed with that. Next slide, please. Fraud is any intentionally deceptive action made any deceptive action made for personal gain or to damage another. Um, grantees and their subrecipients must immediately report suspected fraud. Minnesota Housing promotes a speak up, see something, say something culture, whereby internal staff, external business partners, and the general public are encouraged to report instances of fraud, misuse of funds, conflicts of interest, or other concerns without fear of retaliation. And there are multiple ways in which you can report this that are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Grantees and subgrantees must maintain copies of all of your books, records, program files, documents, and any accounting procedures relating to the Home Help MN program during the term of the contract and for a minimum of six years to the end of the contract. Documents may be subject to examination by Minnesota Housing, the State Auditor, the Legislative Auditor, and the U.S. Department of the Treasury. All of your program files must also be maintained in a secure and organized format. Some examples of documents that you'll need to save and retain, and retain include the executed grant contract agreement, any monthly reports and invoices, marketing materials, and any documents submitted by subgrantees. Next slide, please. And here's where I hand it back over to Vanessa. Thank you, Chrissy. OK, I'm going to move into invoicing and reporting. We will cover this in detail at January 31st. I'll be able to show you the forms and templates that will be required, but today I just wanted to give a brief overview. We will be able to reimburse you on a monthly basis, and so an invoice and report will be due the 15th of each month. Once you submit the invoice and report, um, it will also ask you to include an itemized expense form 
receipts for materials, payroll documentation, and again, that progress report. Those things will be submitted to me each month by email. And then we were also requesting, actually requiring that you uh, set up a cost code to document all the program expenses. So in QuickBooks, that's also called you know, a class, um, so that you're setting up something with your bookkeeper or if you do your books um, with an outside accountant, making sure that they're tracking all of the expenses to that code so that you can easily sort and report. And then we, when we come to monitor, we can look at that as well. Next slide, please. Travel reimbursement. A few of you included travel expenses on your budget. And just a couple of things for you to keep in mind. One, the travel expense that you quoted on your budget will also be written into your contract as a maximum amount allowed on travel. So that's kind of a set in stone amount. So be sure to check that when you look at your contract. And then when you're calculating your travel expense, if you're calculating mileage, you'll be using the state mileage reimbursement rate, which is 58.5 cents per mile right now. If you're planning on any other travel expenses for this program, let me know if it's something other than mileage so that I can make sure that it's eligible. Next slide, please. Conflict of interest. So. As part of this program, grantees are required to have a written conflict of interest policy. Last week when I sent you that contract package, it did include a form, a conflict of interest form, asking you if you do have a policy, yes or no. So I want you to be sure to fill that out um, and send it back. It also, also asks you to disclose any conflicts of interest on that form as well. So an example that you might want to think about is if you plan to pay a family member to perform any services or if there's any sort of connection to any of your sub grantees. Those are things you'll want to disclose right away so that we can work through them rather than waiting until later um, to discover. If you're unsure if you have a conflict or unsure um, if your policy is sufficient or unsure of kind of where to get started, let me know and we can talk through kind of what we're expecting from you at this point. And then on an ongoing basis, if conflicts arise, those can be reported through our standard reporting channels. Next slide, please. All right, before I take questions, I do want to just mention another procedure that is in the works. It's our language access procedure. We'll be talking more about that on the 31st in conjunction with the marketing discussion. And then as we're working through the program, there may be some changes or things that come up that are also required. And so I will just be letting you guys know as they come up or as changes are made. So now I'd like to open it up to questions. If any questions have come up this far, let me know. Feel free to raise your hand or just speak up. Are we good to go? Any questions on conflict of interest, data practices? All right, we'll have more time for questions later too. So if something comes to mind, jot it down and we'll take some time to answer those later. And right now we're going to switch over to Ruth, who's going to talk about uh, monitoring. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Colleen. Um, so um, certainly if your organization is selected to be monitored by Minnesota Housing, we'll go into a lot more detail at a later time. Um, but just wanted to spend a couple of minutes today um, just sharing a little bit more about um, our team and um, what you can expect uh, with a monitor in a monitoring engagement at a high level. So um, I am part of a team of three people uh, that supports uh, monitoring of the single family grants. Um, so Anne Jeanette is on, on the call as well as um, Jordan. Um, 
Uh, we are part of a team that's separate from the programs team and report to our single family divisions uh, operations manager. Um, we conduct monitoring per the requirements of the funding source and the state of Minnesota Office of Grants Management uh, policies. Um, just a few things about what you can expect in a monitoring engagement um, for the foreseeable future anyway. Uh, monitoring is likely to be remote. Um, currently materials are submitted via leap file, which is a secured file exchange system uh, that you may already be familiar with. Um, we do conduct pre monitoring meetings um, where we meet with uh, your organization's contacts, whomever is um, in charge of providing the materials back to us. Um, and during that time, we review the list of items that are required and answer any questions that you have. Um, you can also expect to have adequate time to respond to the requested materials, and we really strive to make this process as collaborative as possible. Uh, we don't um, ever want this process to feel like it's a gotcha. Um, you know, it is it is a requirement that we conduct the monitoring um, and through that process, our hope is is that, um, you know, if there are areas that uh, maybe need to be enhanced or improved in your organization, um, that we can work together to find um, some solutions uh, for that. Um, just a couple of things to keep in mind, um, certainly very timely with uh, with this training um, for a smoother monitoring engagement down the line um, is really maintaining uh, organized and detailed files. Um, I know there will be further conversations at the end of the month on invoicing and reporting. Um, you know, but just keep in mind, especially um, and if if you've been through other audits or monitoring, this will hopefully feel similar. Um, but you know, part of our role is to do um, financial reconciliation. So um, in that, you know, um, we'll be pulling, um, you know, potentially timesheets, um, pay stubs, um, you know, wire transfer information through a bank account um, if that's how employees are paid. Um, you know, any of the items on your budget are subject to being uh, selected for financial reconciliation. And through that, we'd be selecting or collecting the supporting documentation. So proof of the expense and proof of payment um, is just what you can what can expect with that. Certainly, if you have questions, reach out to Vanessa and she can connect with us. Um, if there's items that you're not sure if you should be keeping or um, or whatever the case may be. Um, another tip is just to make sure to ask questions throughout the process. Um, you know, we're we're here to help. We want to help make that process as smooth as possible um, for you. And uh, so certainly ask questions as things come up and then uh, be engaged in that monitoring process. So make sure that you're responsive. Uh, reach out if you need more time to submit materials and things like that. Um, and I know this was stated before, but just one other thing to keep in mind is that um, your organization may be selected for monitoring from others in addition to Minnesota Housing. So everything that I've shared today, I would guess would be um, similar to um, tips and, and ways to um, have a smoother monitoring engagement with uh, any entity that were to um, conduct monitoring. But again, um, I'm just speaking really from the perspective of uh, our role um, in our in what we're doing with um, single family grants monitoring. And that's what I have related to monitoring. Thanks for your time. Ruth, Thank you. Ruth. I do have one question from the chat. Oh. Um, so just raise this now, maybe before we leave, if that's OK, Vanessa. Um, so thank you for what seems to be a well thought out program. Will you be providing templates of forms that capture what information you're monitoring tracking? Um, I'll maybe answer that in part. Um, there will be templates that uh, Vanessa will be sharing related to invoicing and reporting. So the monthly reporting and invoicing, which will be really form the bulk of um, the ongoing kind of reporting responsibilities. There are templates that are, are being developed and will be made available for you. And then if you have other questions about templates or forms, let's first get you introduced to those things. Those I think are the primary things 
Um, and then I'm sure monitoring, um, at some point there may be a checklist if you're selected for monitoring and other risks shaking our heads. So I'm not going too far adrift here. Um, if you're selected for monitoring, but even well before that, just using the established templates and forms for that regular monthly invoice and um, reporting on outcomes and the activities and engagement you've done will absolutely have templates for you to fill out. Ruth or Vanessa, anything to add there to that question? I think that covers it. I mean, certainly, um, especially after the training later this month, if there's other questions about um, monitoring specifics, um, certainly reach out to us. Um, but yep, Devin's, Devin's spot on. I mean, the, the materials that are provided as part of that monthly reporting, um, that's really what we'll be starting with as we look to do monitoring um, and make our selections about um, or from the materials that are that are part of that um, submission packet from your organization. Thank you. I think the only thing else I'll add is any of those topics that Chrissy and I presented today, um, data practices, conflict of interest, those are also potential monitoring pieces. So one thing we're working on is putting all of those procedures in writing so that you can kind of see what is expected of you rather than memorizing everything that was said today. So think about that too, beyond just the financial piece. Um, do you have a conflict of interest policy? Um, how are you handling private data if you're collecting it? Um, are you giving the data privacy notice? Those sorts of things, but we can tag team and talk about those in the future as well. All right, I think Amanda Welliver is up next to talk about marketing and communications. Well, hello everybody. Um, as I mentioned in the introductions, I'm working on the communications for our federally funded COVID relief programs. This includes Home Help MN and also Rent Help MN. Um, there's some similarities in how the programs will um, be marketed. Um, we can move to the next slide, please. So, um, the a major similarity is we're going to have a toolkit of information for Home Help MN that will be in the Home Help brand. Um, this will include customizable materials, flyers, posters, social media images, and text that you can use to get the word out about the program. This toolkit will be in four languages. It will be in English, Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. And um, mirror the other program materials that we have. Um, we request that when you are promoting the program that you use these branded materials and we can move to the next slide, please. Um, for the purpose of consistency and to increase the name recognition for the program and to help build trust with people that we're trying to reach so that they can I immediately identify the materials as related to the Home Health MN program. Uh, these programs will be developed by our marketing vendor and um, We'll beginning beginning the process of developing the home help brand and these materials in the coming weeks. And we really value your perspective in um, as we develop these program materials to um, let us know, are these going to be useful? Do you think these will be messages that will resonate with the audiences that you're trying to reach? Um, also, we'll value your um, feedback once the materials are produced. So can we can move to the next slide, please. And if there are materials that are that you find will be helpful um, that aren't included in this toolkit, we do have a procedure for um, if you wish to produce your own materials. Um, first of all, if you if there's something that you think would be helpful for the toolkit, you can certainly make a recommend or a request of us, and we can consider that for adding materials to the toolkit that would be available to all partners. But if you have materials you wish to produce that are not included in the toolkit, we would like to review these before they're um, put into publication. We have the procedure that's within the, the program pr policies. Um, you create a draft, you send it to Vanessa, and then Vanessa will share that with the communications team and we can review and get back to you with feedback on that. The toolkit will include templates 
that you can customize um, that would not require additional approval if you're using the templates um, and just changing dates or adding a logo for that. Um, next slide, please. So there's, we know everyone's eager to get going on this and probably receiving questions about the home help program. And we wanted to let you know that there are some um, things, steps that people can take today before the program launches. Um, the first is to sign up for e-news updates. And the sign up is MN Housing. I, I'll, put, I'll put a direct link or we can put the direct link in the chat maybe. Um, I don't know if it's, can be clicked on within the presentation. Um, but the mnhousing.gov slash home help news is a uh, shortcut that will get you to the e-news sign up to receive updates about the program. Um, the other things that can, steps that can be taken today, homeowners who are worried about foreclosure shouldn't wait for the program to open to take these steps. Um, First is to explore a loss mitigation solution with their servicer. They should be in communication with their servicer now. Uh, another thing to do is, and there, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has resources about um, workout options, loss mitigation options. Next slide, please. So homeowners should also if they're worried about falling behind in their mortgage payments, if they're worried about foreclosure, they should connect as soon as possible with a foreclosure prevention counselor. This is a HUD approved housing counselor. Um, the, they can be, there's a list available on the Home Ownership Center of Minnesota website. Um, housing counseling is free and it is um, a resource available to any homeowner. There's no income restrictions on who can receive housing counseling. Um, this will help them understand the foreclosure process and um, connect with their servicer and understand the options that are available to them. And generally with foreclosure, the sooner you um, start looking for help, the better. Um, a common, a common um, mistake is to wait too long to ask for help and, be, and then there are fewer resources available the longer you wait. Uh, homeowners can also apply for assistance with their utilities through the Energy Assistance Program through the Minnesota Department of Commerce. And then the final thing is the, the reason it's important to work with a HUD certified counselor is there are many, um, many people out there trying to um, scam homeowners who are in trouble. If someone's um, having, having problems with their mortgage, they, they're going to um, Sorry, there are public lists for foreclosure filings and people who are on that list will start to get mailings from people who are trying to scam them. Um, people will offer to help with mortgages for a fee. They'll um, want personal financial information and um, this is a good sign that it's a scam. So they should seek help through a certified HUD certified housing counselor. We've got some information available at stophomescams.org that has um, signs that uh, offer for help as a scam and uh, what to do if you think you've received a scam offer. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Time for questions, concerns, comments, or thoughts. Feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out or raise your hand or just speak up with something that they want to clarify. Okay, Anika says it will be helpful to have a resource sheet that we can give out as well. Anika, do you mean a resource sheet for the program or for compliance? Thank you, Vanessa. I'm, I really am, am meaning um, all that was just covered, some of those other additional resources that maybe mm -hmm. aren't available through Home Health. Um, and then the follow-up question to that would be, is there, um, is there any reason why anybody would be um, ineligible? 
and and because our thought process is that you know if they're not then we want to be able to give them as many other tools and resources as possible thank you yes great question Devin. do you want to talk about that i'm muted talking to myself the primary reason someone uh, would be ineligible would be potentially because they were over income. That's why I think it'll be helpful um, if we do it at the January or shortly thereafter session. We can go into some of the income and in, in scenarios so that you can see what some of the incomes look like and some of the geographies you're working on and we can cover that with you. Um, right now there's sort of a, a complex web link on HUD's website with different income levels, but we can break that down in a simpler way and get ready to share that with you. But income's kind of a key eligibility factor. They have to have had a COVID impact or a coronavirus COVID-19 impact after that January date of 2020. So there will be homeowners that were experiencing delinquency prior to that date. At this point, um, we don't have all of our, our final policies um, published or yet through um, our approval status, but at this point in time, we're not anticipating we would allow the program to serve people who were delinquent prior to that January, I think it's January 21st, 2020 date. So people that were experiencing delinquency kind of prior to um, wouldn't necessarily be eligible for this program. And then they have to be able to demonstrate that they had um, either that material reduction in income or that material increase in living expenses. So we are working really hard to align the program and make it streamlined and simple and really um, just trying to meet the, the requirements of the Treasury guidance and not layer on additional requirements where possible. So um, these things are essentially Treasury requirements Though I will say Minnesota Housing has established the 100% AMI as the income limit for the uh, program. Treasury will allow us to serve as long as 60% of the funds go to 100% of people at 100% AMI or below. Treasury is okay with it. We are trying to target all of our assistance, at least initially, um, because if there's more demand at that income level, we want to make sure those incomes get served first. Um, and so those are some of the basic eligibility requirements. The other thing I can share just from a program implementation standpoint, um, Treasury also permits, you know, once we have the, the application, the pre-screening and application materials developed, we're in the process of developing those right now, but once we have those developed, we'll want to share those with you just so that you have some orientation and understanding of what's involved in the application process. Um, but one of the things Treasury does allow is they allow the use of something called um, basically an income proxy. So not we're anticipating not everyone will have to submit full income documentation for the program either so households that live in certain zip codes that um, meet certain ami levels will not have to provide income documentation at least that's what we're thinking from a program design standpoint um, but there will be a subset of um, eligible uh, homeowners that will have to provide income documentation under the program so we will We'll, we'll want to cover all of those details with you kind of as we move toward our program launch implementation. Um, but really the key things are income, they have to have had a COVID impact, they have to be behind um, and have it have to have a need for the assistance. Uh, and then, you know, we certainly um, want to make sure that their loan servicer gets set up and the third party that we have to make the payment to get set up in our system so that we can make the payments to those third party entities. But those are some of the key basic eligibility criteria under the program. And I think your questions around just what resources and how best to refer people to, there might be a, a good resource um, kind of link toolkit that we could start to develop. Um, some things are on our webpage already, um, but then there are some great resources and tools um, other places as well. But I think the two key things for you, maybe three, um, to remember are if someone's behind on utility payments, um, we'll want to refer them for energy assistance to the Department of Commerce. If they're behind on homeownership housing related expenses, we still want to get them at least make that referral to a housing counselor, that free service, um, as well as make sure making sure they're talking with their loan servicer around what workout options could be available because it's possible there could be workout options 
um, outside of this homeowner assistance fund program that might be the best fit for the homeowner and a good fit for them. So those would really be some key things, but we can make sure we get some of those links made available to you along with some of the procedures and other things. And, you know, this is the start of our journey together. So these are awesome questions and we're going to keep talking and Vanessa is going to be at your side, helping to support you as questions come up that homeowners start to ask you that you may um, not have anticipated. So, um, but we also don't want you to feel like you have to have all the answers and that's where referring out understanding the network of housing counseling agencies that provide that fee service Amanda was talking about. Um, we want to try and make some of some of this easier on you too, that you don't you don't have to become an expert in loss mitigation and loan servicing, but you know how to refer people on a relatively easy basis as well. Thank you, Devin. Jeanette's asking if we'll be using box.com like Rent Help does for the document library and resources. Great question. We're still discussing. Um, right now, it looks like we'll be using a um, private website URL that you can access to download procedures, to download your monthly report form, as well as trainings like this um, instead of box.com. But we're still working on the details and we'll be sure to let you know about that. Uh, question for you, Jeanette. Do you like box.com? Was it easy to use? I love box.com. It was really easy to use. Um, okay. And then it also got to set up as we as we encountered different issues, whether it was a technical issue, like a glitch, or um, as we encountered issues with applications, um, we could enter that into spreadsheets and then get responses from staff that way um, as a way of not inundating the, the program officers or the, or the individuals that were responsible for all the work with so many questions. So I really enjoy it. Others um, did not. To be totally honest, um, it just it takes a minute to get used to, and then as we had so many different um, spreadsheets and logs to complete, I think it got a little bit um, a little bit jumbled too. Okay. But being able to go in and access our communications kit um, immediately, download it because then we would take that kit um, and then we would translate it into um, Nepalese or whatever language language that we needed. It was very nice because it was just easy. And simple. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Any other opinions on using box.com or a website? Are there questions on monitoring or the program, your outreach, the contract? Anything come up? We all feeling ready to go. We thought it was really important to connect with you um, right after you received your grant agreements to be able to go over some of the details in the agreements. And um, if you're like me, sometimes you need time to digest what you're hearing <laughs> and to go back and relook at things and have conversations with really smart colleagues in your organizations or with Vanessa. So we really um, just really appreciated connecting with you early kind of right after we got the grant agreements out so that we could start these conversations and hopefully give you some good resources to make that a little more digestible and i know someone's got a question too mahmoud uh yes uh, first and important um thank you so much for going over this detailed program um my question is uh, two questions the first question is when we're designing the flyers for our uh, families that we're going to be helping um what are the certain things that need to go on that flyer? For example, I think earlier you mentioned the logo and the mental housing that needs to go on there. And I think earlier, and um, when you we were talking about the uh, reimbursement, such, such as the insurance, um, does that include the workers' comp one? Those are the two questions I had. Yes, thank you. So on the flyers, and I'm going to let Amanda chime in here too. Ideally, you'll start with the flyers that we provide. So we're going to provide a marketing toolkit for you to just download things, add your logo, and send them off. So those will be in um, four languages, English, Somali, Spanish, and Hmong. And then if there's another language that your organization can translate into, you could translate the flyer, send us that content, and then we could put that into the flyer as well. So ideally you start there, 
with what we're providing. And then if you want to create your own, um, if you're finding, you know, you're not finding something you really want, first of all, let us know like, hey, I really wish there was this sort of flyer um, because we might be hearing that from many different people. If if you still want to create your own piece, then we ask that you create it, run it by us to make sure that it meets our logo standards and whatnot. Um, give our communications team a chance to just take a look at it before you put it out into the world. Um, Amanda, anything else you want to share on on making flyers? No, I think you've covered that well. OK, and then in terms of your question about workers comp, um, let me make sure I understand your question. Are you saying that if you change your workers comp insurance, um, would you need to let us know? Right. Correct, yes. If that's a piece that you're using some of the funds to pay for, whether it's you know in your admin budget bucket or whatnot, any changes to those vendors, you'd need to let us know. Um, and let us know before you make that change because we need to look at the bidding requirements and it's based on how much the contract is with the, the vendor in terms of what it triggers, what sort of process you need to go through before you hire that vendor. So let me know early um, as you're looking at those changes so we can work through it together. I answered both those questions. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. I have a few things to go through before we end our time together. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, look for the contracts coming your way in DocuSign. Those will be coming this week to your designated signer. So if it's someone other than you um, that's on the call today, just make sure that person is aware that they'll be getting an email from DocuSign with that contract. Be sure to sign the, send the required documents to me that I requested, so a W-9, an EFT form, the proof of workers' comp, insurance, the conflict of interest form, and your vendor list. So there's quite a few things you'll need to send to me one, over email. One question, uh, Fanisa, yes. just said. Go ahead. Uh, for the last one, the friend list, uh, are you talking about the accountant? Uh, what's that? Yep, so anybody that you're paying um, through this program. So if you're paying for an accountant, that's, a, that's not an employee. So like a contractor, you would that include that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank, yep. you. thank you. And feel free to reach out. Um, I try to include on your list the items that you included on your budget that look like they, they would have outside vendors, but feel okay. free to confirm with me. Thank you. You're welcome. And then in terms of the debarred and suspended search, remember that you have to do that for each of your current vendors. And I'll be holding those tutorials this Friday and then next week as well to just go through that together so you don't have to spend the time learning that process. So that will just be a jump on the call and work through it with me sort of experience. And then we'll be meeting again on the 31st. I see there's some questions. I'll just go through this real quick and then loop back to you. But on the end of the month, we'll be meeting to talk about reporting and invoicing as well as marketing and communications. And of course, I'm here to help with anything. And so I think Jeanette, you had a question. Yeah, and it's actually um, a simple one. Could When you send us out the meeting notifications, is there any way you could send it out as an invitation? So then when we respond, yes, it automatically on the calendar. I th yes, I think I can do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was an easy one. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Julie. So um, the depart and suspended, is there a form that we need to fill out to show that we did that? If there's a checkbox on your vendor list, so you'll just be checking that off that you completed that. OK, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Um, another thing to note on that, you also need to share or save screen shares or print out in your program files. So during monitoring, that is something that can be checked. 
and the way they confirm that you looked at that DeBarden suspended list is through screenshots or printouts that you save in the program file. It's another kind of cumbersome thing to do on that SAM.gov website. It's not as easy as it should be, so I'll be working through that with you as well. And Mahmood, you had a question. Oh, never mind, you answered it. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Asad, did you have a question? Uh, no, I don't have any question. Uh, thank you. If I have anything, I will I will email you. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, yep. thank you. And feel free to email me or call me. I am working remotely, but I have an office phone that rings directly to my home desk. So don't feel like you're bothering me or anything. You can pick right. up the phone and give me a call as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, I have a question here. Yes, asking for um, recorded presentation. Couldn't take notes fast enough. For sure. Another thing that we're going to do is put our procedures into written form so that you can reference each of the pieces we talked about, which might be, well, hopefully will be very useful to you to see what are the requirements, what is expected of you, what is Minnesota Housing doing, so we can get both of those pieces of information to you. Any other questions or thoughts? OK, well, again, thank you so much for being here. We're five minutes uh, ahead of schedule, which is great. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day, and I hope you all stay warm. Feel free to reach out to me as we go through the next few days in terms of signing contracts and, and getting all those forms in. Um, will I share the slides? Yes. In the follow up email, I'll share PDFs of the slides for you to reference, as well as those uh, points of information to share with homeowners right now. All right. Again, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Community Connectors. Thank you, Minnesota Housing Team. And I look forward to working with you. Have a good day. Thank you so much. So thank much. you. Bye bye.